Doyle's been forced into the situation of building the Kawasaki. The Hondas have been dominating improved production touring bike racing in Australia for the last year. On pole position for today's race, Michael Cole, who won the Coca-Cola 800 here three months ago on the Honda RSC machine, specially developed in Japan, both in its suspension and in its engine. Almost 1,100 cc's of outright brute horsepower going through allegedly a standard frame, but in fact a very sophisticated machine indeed. On second position on the grid on bike four, Dennis Neal, the man tipped to win today, the local tearaway rider. He's faster than Michael Cole in sprint conditions, and today's 20-lap race has to be seen as a sprint. There's 25 of them on the grid, John, every one of them putting out over 100 brake horsepower from its one-litre motor. And that's what motorcycle racing is all about. That's why its popularity is continuing to a degree that it is taking over from the people in the car racing field, the cams, who talk about it while the bikes do it. On third position on the grid, bike nine, that's Jim Budd, the lime green leathers, going off now on a warm-up lap. This is where they're headed on the Grand Prix circuit. Uh, Michael Cole there, he also won the Arai 500 kilometre race at Bathurst. Budd running beside him in the debut of this bike from the brilliant tuner and race bike preparer Neville Doyle who's campaigned Europe with Greg Hansford taken him to two second places in World Championship Series and two third places in the last two years. This is the Grand Prix circuit again, we say again that you go down further along the straight to Tirana, then Rothmans which is the first gear corner, then under the bridge they come up to third, back to second for Coca-Cola, down to first for Ampol, over the bridge, run then in second gear all the way through the S's to Sutton's third gear on the short run up the straight out of Sutton's corner. We'll come to that. They come through the S's, Sutton's in second gear all the way and this is a big field and some top runners. Four, five bikes entered by Team Honda, one entered by Team Kawasaki, one entered by Suzuki Australia and then a whole pile of privately entered bikes dealer prepared bikes as well including Wayne Gardner on mentor motorcycles entry of a Malloy Honda Peter Malloy that took Alan Moffat to many of his victories Warwick Brown and many other top Australian drivers uh, getting involved in motorcycle racing it was Peter Malloy's own road bike which he's modified and uh, put onto the race track he's this only just taken on Wayne Gardner in fact in the last couple of meetings as he's right before then he had Roger Hayes who's now moved to Team Honda Young Wayne Gardner, a uh, Wollongong rider of immense capacity and capability. He's one of the finds of the 1979-1980 field. There he is on bike 10, just Those going now into Coca-Cola Corner. Bike 6, in fact, chucked in behind Alan Decker on 10, one of the Team Honda entries. There he is, Gardner. This is the Malloy Honda, different to the Team Honda bikes in its uh, engine specification. That gives you an idea of the power out of them in first gear as he soars onto the... <laughs> Bridgestone Bridge, and boy, if you can ride these things, you can ride or drive almost anything. The, the bike blokes look sometimes in awe at some of the cars and think they wouldn't mind a, a go in a Formula 5000 or whatever, but the car guys look at the bikes, I can tell you, at these 2 plus 4 meetings and shake their heads and say, rather them than me, and no way do they want to mix it, and they really do see the boys like Dennis Neal, Mike Cole, Tony Hatton before he stopped racing the end of last year, Roger Hayes, Alan Decker, all of these who handle the enormous power so well, they look on them as some sort of heroes. The bikes now lining up behind the travelling marshal as they come down to start this race, getting themselves into some sort of go capacity. Starter on his rostrum. An enormous amount of horsepower gathered there in uh, some very compact machines just one wide slick tyre to transmit the power to the ground. The bike's capable of immense wheel stands as Graham Crosby, the man who won this race last year here at Oran Park showed when without much competition he turned on a spectacular electrifying display of magnificent bicycle control with his wheel up in the air all the way down the straight changing up through five gears. Today, however, there'll be no grandstanding. There's too much flight riding on this and too many top competitors. The revs rising, they're about to go. Bruce Rands, the bravest man at Oran Park, standing right in front of this 
immense amount of horsepower waiting to be unleashed, patting his hands down and saying, fellas, take it easy, not ready to go yet. Emmanuel Blanco, who did the wheel stand there, and just getting his visor, missed it up, and they're away in another bad and start, Jim quite frankly. But Jim Bart Jim takes the lead. leading well on nine. Followed there by Roger Hayes, 163, Bud very wiggly, down under brakes, and it's Roger Hayes on the Team Honda bike, 163, who blasts through to the lead. What a great start for him, but he really got the power going well, and look at the way that bike was skipping and dancing. Wayne Gardner in second place on the Malloy bike, Michael Cole third on bike number five, Dennis Neal fourth on bike four, Ro uh, Jim Bud Bart. fifth on bike number five in behind him. Hayes, the fastest man around here for so long, hasn't ridden a super bike in five years until he got on this, only in the last couple of months. The bike is not as well developed as some of those chasing him, and Hayes is out to prove something the way he's riding right now, certainly well and truly right on the limit. Gardner behind him on the Malloy bike, challenging hard now, coming up to, to edge of the back wheel. Hayes just pulls out in front on Sutton's corner. They are absolutely on the limit, as you say, John Smales. Roger Hayes, Wayne Gardner, number five, Michael Cole. The Victorian has had so much success. Dennis Neal down underneath him. Neal, the big boy, up into third place. One of the hardest riders in Australian racing. In fact, another rider said that he's the, probably the fastest rider, not necessarily the tidiest, but the fastest. And he will literally rub shoulders with other riders if he wants the line for a corner. Cole Michael trying Cole. to run with him and Bud in fifth. But it's Hayes still in the lead. Hayes exploring to the limit the, uh, the suspension. Neil underneath or trying to get underneath Gardner. Gardner determined to get past Roger Hayes. Neil coming with him. Cole with him. So much horsepower and such a small section of track. Whoa, and, and down goes down. Bud. But he'll and be he up and away. Again. Well, that bike was looking uh, wonky and providing nothing's damage. He'll be bump starting it and away again. Jim Bud trying to build up speed. He hasn't got enough speed to bump start it. No electrics on this bike, so it has to be push started. Does it go now? No. Tantalizing. Nobody there to push it for him. Trying again. 15 kilograms of electrics taken off the bike, but Bud now can't get the thing started. It'll start now, though. He just needs a bit more speed. And it'll be a crackle and a rasp. Not enough speed. See the back wheel locking up there as the field spears away from him. How much compression has that bike got to not start? There it goes. He's away, but he's so far behind the field now, in last position. And in fact, the first of the riders now are about to come onto the main straight. Yes, so up in the fifth place now goes Alan Decker, the Victorian on bike 10. So it is Hondas in the first five places. Roger Hayes from Wayne Gardner. Dennis Neal. Michael Cole and Alan Decker. Hondas, look at the chain slapping around on Roger Hayes' bike there. 163, all of them chain drive because, of course, that involves the least power loss. And look at the angles of lean of the bikes. Dennis Neal running out wide. Roger Hayes completely and utterly committed into the dip there. And Michael Cole, the little Victorian, in behind them too. Big boy Dennis Neal getting sideways and coming up to join them, Alan Decker making good ground on the leading quartet. 17 and a half laps to go. This thing should be pacing itself out. Instead, it is a real sprint race with no quarter given. Dennis Neal, the favourite for the race, perhaps hanging back just a little bit, seeing what will happen in front of him with Wayne Gardner, especially a less experienced rider. But no, Neal now slams up trying to take second place from Wayne Gardner. But Gardner's having none of it as he comes down into BB then and goes underneath Roger Hayes. Hayes takes him out again. Dennis Neal takes the, takes the advantage there while the two leading riders are having their set to, to move up just slightly. But Michael Cole now coming up in fourth position. Cole not renowned as a sprint rider, more a long distance rider, but he's giving nothing to these sprint riders now as they reach the end of the main straight, 200 kilometers an hour. Roger Hayes opens up a small gap there. Neal into second place, Gardner back to third and he won't like it. Big boy Dennis Neal, look at him. Big good looking man with a great bead, beard. Broke both legs and he's into the lead. Broke both legs in a bad accident a couple of years ago, but one of the most forceful riders on Australian racetracks. And uh, there he goes into the lead from third to first in a matter of a couple of quarters. Now wrapping the power on, 9,000 revs. Roger Hayes, look at the standard chassis. 
flexing and weaving as the bikes go up there as they force on the 100 odd brake horsepower and ride them so well. Big difference between Neil's bike and Hay's bike. Neil's bike was fully developed in Japan. The chassis of the bike is a full Japanese workout. Meantime, Roger Hayes' bike there in second position is a local 900cc Honda chassis with the RSC engine put in it. In other words, it's a standard motorcycle with a Formula One engine in it. Now, how can anyone be expected to ride a beast like that? And also waiting for bigger pistons. But here's Wayne Gardner. He wants Roger Hayes. Cole in behind them. And they know the threat that if big boy Dennis Neal gets away, look at the three of them. On the straight there, 9,000 revs in third, 9,000 in fourth, then in fifth, and down through the sweeper. But big boy Dennis Neal, and so it, much in command of these big bikes. And it's Michael Cole now in the second position. Michael Cole, the long distance rider, has turned into a sprinter for today. He on the other works, RSC Honda. It's just showing that the sophistication of the fully built Japanese motorcycles is where it's all at, because Cole is managing to get ahead of the two local builds. Gardner was arguing over second place, but the others didn't hear his argument and is now in fourth place. And uh, Alan Decker in fifth behind him. And his 20 lap race they've completed, they have 16 to go, 15 at the end of this one. So they're coming up to complete five as Neil starts to assert himself in the lead. How does he know the limits of that big bike so well as he starts to pull away from very similar motorbikes? The big man on the bike, the biggest of them all so committed but so riding so beautifully look at the fluid flow of the man as the stomach comes right up under his rib cage over the top there then breaks and he is extracting every possible bit of performance out of this big rsc honda of 1062 cc's neil one of the crashes of australian motorcycle racing crashed twice or once rather in the castrol six hour last year but was alleged to be the man responsible for bringing down Ron Bolden in the same race while the two of them were dicing for the lead. Neil is a man who will give no quarter to any motorcycle rider ever. He is renowned amongst his competitors as being dangerous to be near. He says he's not, he says he's a nice guy, but he wants that piece of track and if they want to, if they want to get on it then they're going to have to force him out of the way. Nonetheless, Neil is just so quick and so fearless on the motorcycle that he's a marvel to behold. He is a nice guy, he's a smiling bloke and he looks like a daff, dapper, suave businessman actually. Not at all the public image of a motorcyclist. But my goodness, he can ride a big bike. He is so much in command. Look at that. He is on a production bike. And look at the angles of lean of Dennis Neal on bike number four. This is virtuoso riding. It's beautiful. The bike is sliding. It, in fact, the back wheel is getting out past the line of the front wheel. But Neil, with the most beautiful amount of balance and throttle and steering correction, is holding it under control. Standing in the pits, John Bow and John Wright marvelling at this sort of stuff. They just wish they could send their Formula 5000s around there like that. Well, in fact, John Wright retiring, if you like, from motorcycle racing to Formula 5000 racing because he had three bad crashes when he did take up motorcycle racing. Neil right in there on the apex of the corner and just being bumped slightly in behind this big man doing so well. It's so exciting at watching him ride is number five, Michael Cole. As you say, John, the enduro, smooth, pacing type rider, but nevertheless, right up with the, with the sprinters, in front of Roger Hayes on 163 in third place, Wayne Gardner in fourth place on sixth, and Wayne Gardner certainly is not going to accept that lying down, and then behind him is Alan Decker on number 10. Look at Gardner, young boy, but rides so well also, not with the experience on these big bikes, as such as Dennis Neal and Roger Hayes, who specialised in this area of racing for years. A lot of factory money going into this exercise. This is the equivalent of the Marlborough Holden dealer team or of Ford Australia going motor racing because a lot of money goes in from Honda Australia and from Kawasaki Australia into these entries. Cole now opening up a small gap again in second position on Roger Hayes in third and Hayes having a devil of a time to hold out Wayne Gardner who in fact is riding the bike that Hayes helped to develop with Peter Malloy. Gardner further back there you can see his bike weaving under speed as he comes out onto the straight. Uh, sorry Michael Cole. They come up to lap one of the slower riders. My goodness these men are riding smoothly and well and rain is starting to fall. 
and well. these bikes are all on slick tyres. Well, it'll be a while before the track's wet and uh, we have to see whether the rain continues, but uh, that really could make life very difficult. It's pretty slippery down the back with tyre rubber down there. Gardner up inside on... Uh, Alan Decker got underneath Wayne Gardner. Decker on 10 has slipped by him, I think. So it's Michael Cole, no Roger Hayes. So Gardner was very nearly through on Roger Hayes. An interesting situation if rain does continue because there is a lot of oil and rubber on the track, rubber laid by the cars, of course, with their big slick tyres. And Gardner now tries an outside run on Hayes. Can't do it, but is nicely setting himself up for a run down into BP Ben. He'll be quicker down into BP Ben. And will he do it? Yes, he will. And what a beautiful setup from Wayne Gardner there, using race tactics like you'd never believe to show Roger Hayes, supposedly the maestro on sprint race tactics, how to do the job. Down the straight he goes, tucking in on the tank of this big unfaired bike and doing somewhere up around 220 kilometres an hour. Remember that a standard CBX Honda down here will do 210 kilometres an hour. So these super bikes, probably doing in fact 225, 230 kilometres an hour down the straight there. No fairing and the force of the wind on the riders at that speed is something fearsome. And, and here's Gardner, Gardner trying to round up Michael Cole. Cole. As they come up to lap 83, that's Graham Wan. Uh, he'll be wondering what on earth is he did. <laughs> this quintet of riders last past. Wan reckon that sort of riding is magic. There he goes, Gardner now, trying to get on the outside of Michael Cole. Can he do it? Well, oh, something's yes going to happen, but... <laughs> no, he hasn't. <laughs> uh, not quite. Well, in some ways I'm glad he didn't, because I reckon if he got through, he'd have had to come off. He'd just have had to produce angles of lean and ask for grip from his tyres that was not there. Roger Hayes further back, Gardner doing the charge now. In the meantime, the race leader, Dennis Steele, on number four. Gardner, though, wants to go forward in the field, wants Michael Cole's position. Michael Cole, the man who debuted the six-cylinder Honda in world racing. The rain getting sharper now, and there's the sign. So the officials have thought that it's getting bad enough to warn them of it. Drips can be seen on the track, although it's by no means covering it at this stage, but just put yourself in the situation of this sort of speed, this amount of power, with slick tyres, nothing. Look at the rain, you can see it there on the track now, and you can see it falling, nothing, to sweep away the water between the track and the tyre. This is dreadfully cruel time and difficult for the riders. And they're less than halfway there. With the end of this lap, they will come up to lap 10 means that they've got half the race to go in these conditions. And Dennis Neal is the first one to call quits. Dennis Neal has backed off to the degree now that Wayne Gardner and Michael Cole have both gone through him, and they're both side by side now as they dive down into the old S's, and it's Cole who takes the lead, Gardner beside him. They cannot do this in these sort it of conditions. It is crazy. It is madness. Wayne Gardner is a known wet weather rider, and I think his reputation's going ahead of his judgment here somehow. He rode the Ducati here at the Coca-Cola 800 in the rain and blitzed the field. And yesterday in the rain, he was very quick. But my goodness, what he's trying to do here is unbelievable. Okay, and so Michael Cole's prepared to argue. Okay, so it's not wet down this end of the circuit. It's raining at the other end of the circuit. It's just starting to rain up here now. And it's Wayne Gardner who's taken the lead. Now, Gardner is the rain master. That's what they say he is. He's showing his team that he's quite happy, but it's Michael Cole who uses the superior power of the Honda to go through again. Ten laps to go in this 20-lap race, just half race distance, and the most vicious stroke of luck for these riders. Gardner from Michael Cole now, then Dennis Neal, who doesn't like the rain as much as they do. And frankly, if any of them like it, they're masochists. Further back, and look at Neil running wide there. He really doesn't like it. He's not at home in the race. Well, there's a race situation changed because of the weather. Spectators and officials now reaching for umbrellas. That's how wet it is. And Dennis Neal shows you there what happens when you put the power on. And he was probably a gear higher there, probably in second gear, and yet the bike was still doing it. Using his foot now, of course, as you saw, to pivot himself around the track to keep the bike upright. Look at Wayne Gardner. 
Van Den Estiel stepping his way through the, uh, feeling his way through the puddles, looking out for the oil, but Wayne Gardner doing nothing of that, using all of the track, and seeming to find a dry line where nobody else can. Wayne Gardner really can feel the track underneath him. He's just edging his way around. The whole point of running on slicks is that, and there's Gardner having a moment, is that uh, they're fine for wet weather running, but there's no way, there's no pattern at all to sweep the water away, and so the water must sit. There's nothing it can do but sit between the tyre and the track, and so you get an aquaplaning situation. It's almost impossible in a car and on a motorbike. It would seem to be impossible, but look at Gardner leaning the bike, feeding the power in beautifully, and going so well, and Michael Cole too in second place, not being disgraced. Track conditions, of course, changing every lap, so as they commit themselves to a corner, they don't know what's going to be at the other end of it. They don't know whether the rain's going to have increased, whether there's going to be more oil placed there. Now, there's Jim Mudd being lapped now by Wayne Gardner, but trying as hard as he can to get this Kawasaki back in the race, but it's obviously been damaged in that fall he had on the second lap, and Bud now an uncharacteristically one lap behind, and nothing he can do about it as young Wayne Gardner sweeps on his winning way. Well, Bud wasn't happy in the rain yesterday with wet weather tyres. He was noticeably less happy than Wayne Gardner, and as he said this morning, I've never won a race yet from my hospital bed. And he's been in a few at his time. But in fact, very badly injured last year in a fall at Amaru Park. Took him three months to come back to form again, to come second in the Castrol six hour last year. Up there on goes the Wayne Gardner. Just as the riding of Dennis Neal was something to behold in the dry. Look at the smoothness and the, the grip that this young boy is getting out of bike number six as he rides it around in the rain. It is really masterful to watch. In the pits, Peter Malloy, his mentor, will be worried so much at the moment because he takes on young people like Wayne Gardner, like Warwick Brown, when Warwick, of course, the Formula 5000 champion, was a very young man, and he has had, Malloy has had a, a magic touch with young people like this to be able to pick talent when it's not got to fruition and to guide it along the way. But Gardner at the moment, a man that must have Malloy very worried because Gardner is pushing this bike awfully hard in these conditions. Rain continues to fall. But the straight is not yet saturated by any means. There's lots of spots of rain. But uh, Gardner just looks so at home. And it's where classic style and correct technique just come to the fore. Look at him coming up on Emmanuel Blanco, or in fact, uh, Alan Blanco, his brother on 184, the Kawasaki, rounding him up, going through him, and uh, just in fact showing every other rider in the field how you ride in the rain. He quite dispirited Michael Cole, although when the rain first started to fall, though Cole's not very far behind him, and then as he gets straight, he gives it everything. Looks out over the back, and uh, Cole's not far behind him, probably three seconds in arrears. There you see him with Alan Blanco between them. And Cole's sweeping past Blanco now, and in fact starting to throw out the challenge again as the track starts to dry off a little bit with the rain easing slightly. It's still falling, but it's just a spit at the moment. And there's Cole quite keen to win this race. I wouldn't say desperate because Cole has developed a fairly good, rep a very good reputation in long distance races and he also would have nothing to prove at this particular point by putting himself in a hospital bed. But at the same stage, Cole would love to take out this race just to prove that he has sprint capability as long as long as well as long distance. The other thing to remember, John, is that it's a three race series to be held at two rounds to be held at later Oran Park meetings through the year. So the riders must keep that in mind too, that to take the booty at the end of the series, you want points in all three rounds. But there a shot of Michael Cole. You can see the, the brace across the front forks, just across the top of that green front mudguard, which is made to stiffen the front forks. One of the problem areas of these big bikes when they start to put a lot of power through the back wheel. And you'll see there the big aluminium clamp, if you can see it just above the green mudguard, try and stiffen the forks 
to stop them flexing when they're cornering and when they're powering out of corners and also, and most particularly, when they're braking heavily coming into corners. A particularly good bike, in fact, is this Michael Cole one. It's won the Coca-Cola 800 here at Oran Park. It won the Array 500 at Bathurst at Easter time. It's done almost 2,000 racing kilometres so far and has yet not needed any major work in the engine. Uh, team Honda manager Clyde Wolfenden has balls oh, and Cole almost gave team manager Clyde Wolfenden a lot of work to do there as he almost put the machine down, looks down now to see just what's wrong and it looks like he's out of the race. He's hurt his leg. He has hurt his leg by the way. He's hurt his leg. I think he's run into, would you believe, another team Honda bike, number 118, John Cretton. And it's really he's hurting him. You can see him reaching down to his leg there. Is he going to push on? Or is he going to come to the pits? Certainly he'd be silly to push on if he's in real pain. He's got five and a half laps to go, and Cole cannot continue. He's run into that bike and done some sort of damage to his leg. Fearsome bad luck for Michael Cole. Rubbing Absolutely writhing in agony. Will he call into the pits at the end of this lap? Here he is with John Fretton again, the man he ran into, and another Team Honda entry on an 812cc Honda. This time, he says, thank you, I'll go by. And uh, not Fretton's fault, because everybody's coping with some fairly severe problems on this slippery track. Perhaps as the, the thing starts to warm up a bit and get better, he'll keep going. I suspect that he will. Michael Cole coming down, and at decision time now, with five laps to go in this 20-lap race, and uh, with agony, coming onto the straight, looking down and trying to forget about it as he goes off down the straight again. Holding his knee now as he rides down the straight, 120, 125 miles an hour, going flat chat it again, Michael Cole back into action. The only thing he can now do is commit himself to the riding and try and forget the pain that his leg must obviously be giving him. Max Thompson he's coming up onto there with the, the, his longer hair trailing up the back of the helmet on bike number 25, the total hunter Suzuki as Suzuki 1000 rounds him up and dispatches him in no mean fashion, the B grade rider, and on his way. Well, Cole's injury certainly taken the pressure off Wayne Gunn who's now in a firm up over the Bridgeton Bridge and down into the Essence. Yes. There's the leader coming round Sutton's corner. Up to left. Jeff Anderson in bike 64 with the wonderful entry name of a quick confusion. <laughs> and uh, to add to the confusion is the rain, of course, as Wayne Gardner goes past the team with obviously a, a fair sense of humour. Gardner looks behind him, cannot see anybody anywhere and wonders just what is going on. Gardner by and a long gap back to Cole, still holding on to second place. Bike five. A long, long way back further in second place. Gardner has blitzed the field under these wet, slippery conditions. Gardner, in fact, the man who in the Coca-Cola 800 race here, some three months ago, absolutely brained the field in the wet opening lap conditions. When on a, on a Ducati, he opened up four seconds a lap, or gained four seconds a lap, on Craig Hansman on the works, Kawasaki. Dennis Neal is a long, long way back in third place, and it's a, an equally long distance back to Roger Hayes, holding down fourth place on 163, but the field really has split up after that frantic opening laps as we look here again at the fabulous style of Wayne Gardner on a wet track on slick tyres on bike number six with such a big lead and with three and a half laps to go. Wayne, Beautiful. Wayne, Beautiful a young man who's <laughs> Wayne, a young man who's, who's getting a lot of riding experience recently. He's riding 350cc Grand Prix machines as well. Uh, and is certainly being discovered by a, a lot of people. Uh -huh. And there we go, Graham Crosby did it when he was in the lead last year, so Wayne Gardner reckons he should be doing it as well. So from here on in, it's showmanship from Wayne Gardner. Well, you're entitled to a bit when you've done such a great job as Wayne Gardner. What I was saying earlier um, was that the right lines, beautiful braking technique, smooth work on the throttle is the essence of going quickly at any time 
but it's accentuated in the rain. And Dennis Neal, as I said earlier, one of the riders said he's the fastest rider in Australia, but not necessarily the smoothest. And that's what it amounts to, that Dennis Neal's forceful style of riding really does not suit wet and slippery conditions, particularly when you're on a slick tyre. Peter Malloy will be absolutely jubilant. He took Team Avon to a six-hour victory, Roger Hayes and Jim Budd, but uh, he hasn't been nearly as prominent in the motorcycle field as he's been in car racing. He's been persevering with this bike. They had mechanical troubles with it at Bathurst, also in the Coca-Cola here in March. But now to see it running so well and to see Gardner riding it in such beautiful style, Peter Malloy will be thrilled. In fact, Malloy is doing a lot of work on motorcycles at the moment, not only this one, but he's turned a lot of his business as well to tuning the superbikes for road-going purposes. This is a beautiful piece of engineering, actually. The men to <laughs> go and say, where are they all? What's wrong? It's not wet, it's not slippery. And uh, then tucks himself in behind the number looking for... There's two laps to go as he went across the start-finish line at the end of that lap there sets off and uh, in about three minutes time victory will belong to Wayne Gardner if he makes no mistakes between now and then. But look at the smooth, confident way he wheels the bike around and comes up to lap an A-grade rider, Steve Fisher. 18 seconds back to Michael Cole, that's how much he lost in that, uh, in that crash. And a further 12 seconds back to Roger Hayes in third position. Cole, we saw there briefly on five, he's holding second place, setting sun in the golden grass out there at Ampol Corner on the Grand Prix circuit. Michael Cole further back coming up to lap number 79, Greg Taylor, Masaki motorcycle engineering entry of a Honda 500, a bike that should suit these conditions well, less power. But the bikes probably have greater limits of adhesion and the riders find it easy to establish and it takes a very slick technique but also uh, adventurous sort of a rider to explore the limits of the bikes under these conditions. Gardner coming up now to get the blue flag and to start off on his final lap. <laughs> What's wrong with the boys? Where's the opposition, says Gardner. And if it's been a big lead set up by Wayne Gardner and if it becomes a big margin for victory, well then it's only a reflection of some superb, exciting riding and a tremendous dice earlier on in the race. The track drying out now, in fact. Which means that if there was another 20 laps to go, we'd see Michael Cole starting to really throw the pressure out again. But of course, with just half a lap remaining on the Soren Park Grand Prix circuit, it's a sure thing now. Wayne Gardner has only to get to the finish to win his first major victory in Australian Superbike racing. Wayne Gardner, the, the 900 Honda, which is the basis for this bike, about a $3,600 uh, so-called Superbike, a four-cylinder twin overhead cam, four valves per cylinder bike, five-speed gearbox as he takes a, his hand off the uh, handlebars there. And from there, the bike highly modified in the rear swing arm to stiffen that up and to get it handling properly. A bit of rigidity built into the forks and a lot of work done on engine, exhaust system, carburation and so on by that wizard of uh, race engineering, Peter Malloy. And uh, here's the wizard at the wheel or at the handlebars pilot, piloting it to victory down into the last corner. BP Bend and the flag marshals even in the previous lap acknowledging a superb ride as they are there, a wheelie and down to the chequered flag, Wayne Gardner on bike number six. Gardner yet to take lessons from Graham Crosby about how to do that wheel stand properly. He couldn't hold it right to the chequered flag and of course he should be if he's going to be a winner in superbike racing in Australia. In cycling action.